Hello and welcome back to my shop. My name is George and I'm coming to you from Chelsea, Quebec. Uh, now it's been since November that I've published uh, anything. It's now March 2018 and I didn't have anything really special uh, to tell you. Uh, today, however, I do. It's uh, a self-centering router mortiser for making mortises that are intended to be used with uh, floating tenons. Uh, the design is uh, not original, uh, but there are some elaborations that I haven't seen elsewhere. So let's get going. The project starts off with uh, a plunging base for a router. After that, it's good, fast, and cheap. Uh, good because it works well and is versatile. Fast because it's fairly easy to build. And uh, cheap because, well, you build it yourself. Now the heart of it is to have a couple of pins on a base that are on the diagonal and the same distance away from the center. Now this idea is not original. There are uh, at least three YouTube videos that show you how to make a separate base uh, with these kinds of uh, pins. So uh, one of them is by Rob North. Uh, another one is a fine woodworking uh, video, a fairly recent one, uh, with a reader tip sent in by um, Adam Lindsay. And the uh, third one is a Charles Neal uh, video. Now in Charles's case, the main video is about uh, using guide bushings. Uh, but in the center of it, he does talk about this kind of a base where uh, there's a separate base with uh, a couple of pins. Um, now all three videos, I've got references to all three videos in the uh, YouTube notes on this uh, channel for this video. Now, uh, the way I did it is just a slight variation of that. Uh, when I took the base plate off, I found all kinds of uh, tapped holes. And, uh, it, and so I was able to find a, a pair of uh, tapped holes. They're M4s as it happens, uh, that are on the diagonal and same distance away from the center. So I just used the existing ones. Um, so a couple of machine screws along with uh, well-sized bushings. These happen to be 3D printed, but you could just as readily make bushings using uh, some doweling, uh, or you could uh, get some um, either plastic or brass tubing where one size fits into the other. These are re easily available in uh, well-stocked hobby shops, uh, and it's referred to as telescoping tubing because one size fits into the other, and so you can just choose a few sizes. Uh, and make a bushing that has the right inner diameter for the uh, screw and uh, an outer diameter that uh, suits your purposes. So the way it works, the way it becomes uh, self-centering is you put it onto your workpiece, you give it a little bit of a counterclockwise twist. Now why counterclockwise? Well your bit is going to be spinning clockwise and uh, that's going to cause the uh, router to want to go counterclockwise, so you go with that. Put a little bit of a counterclockwise twist to it and push the thing uh, away from you. So that's basically how it works. If you think there's problems with this method, uh, you're ahead of me. Let me talk about three problems right off the mark. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, balancing a router on a thin workpiece. Uh, you'll want more stability than the workpiece alone will give you. We're going to solve that problem. Problem number two is that the lead pin falls off long before you've reached the end of your workpiece. Uh, sometimes you're going to want mortises that come close to the end of the workpiece, let's say uh, a quarter of an inch or three-eighths of an inch away from the end. So that's problem number two. Problem number three is that you're not going to want all of your mortises to be centered all of the time. 
and uh, that's a bit of a shortcoming of using just the, the two pins alone. If you're, um, for example, bringing uh, some aprons into um, a table leg, uh, you're going to want the mortises in the table leg not to be in the center. You want them outbound a little bit because that lets you make a deeper mortise and use a longer uh, tenon. So we're going to solve all three of those problems. So here's the solution to the three problems. These are uh, cleats that I made up uh, using MDF. Now I chose uh, MDF because of its uh, dimensional accuracy. If you uh, buy uh, MDF that's a quarter inch thick, you will get exactly one quarter inch thick MDF. And so I made these uh, at different thicknesses. So here are a couple where I took four panels of the uh, MDF and glued them together to give me a one inch thick piece. So there's two of those. Two are three panels together for three quarters of an inch and then a half inch and a quarter inch. And I also tossed in um, a piece of scrap that I had that works out to be one eighth of an inch um, thick. So the uh, dimensions for these guys are uh, 16 inches by three approximately. After you trim them down it'll be a little, a little bit shy uh, of that. Uh, the corresponding metric uh, dimension would be 400 millimeters of length and 75 millimeters of width. And the uh, thicknesses would be about 25, about 19, uh, 12 or 13, 6 and a 3 millimeter thick uh, piece as well. So these guys can all come from a single quarter sheet of uh, quarter inch uh, MDF. As a final step you will want to iron on uh, a nice gliding surface. So edge banding, uh, either um, a wooden edge banding, in my case I used uh, melamine, um, and you'll put it on the thicker of your cleats. So I put it on my one inch uh, cleats, my three quarters, and uh, my half. So here's an example of uh, setting things up. Uh, let's pretend that this is an apron and I want to uh, mortise the ends. Uh, I'm going to start off with a piece of material that's dead flat. So this happens to be a piece of phenolic that I bought from a cutoff bin. Um, any kind of flat material will work, so plate glass, uh, the cast iron top of a table saw, even your own workbench if you know that it's uh, dead flat. Um, now I'm going to raise the workpiece uh, by the thickness of a playing card. So this, um, what I'm doing here is raising it. Uh, but the final outcome is that it's going to be below the surface. So here are my one inch cleats and I'm going to put them on either side of the workpiece. So the faces that I'm going to work are down here and so what I've just done is I've made sure that the glides are a little bit higher than the workpiece. And we'll just clamp things in place. Being careful not to put the clamps too close to the work edge because the pins need to uh, ride past the clamps. Okay, and we'll drop this into a vise. So the vise is clamped onto the workpiece but not onto uh, the cleats. So now when it's time to route, now of course now what I left out is that you'll have this marked for where you want to start and stop. And you can see that we've got a very nice glide past the workpiece. And we've solved problems one and two. So problem one was 
not having a wide enough base, so worrying about this thing uh, teetering. Well, we've got the wide base now, so that's not a problem. And because this is a little bit longer than the workpiece, uh, we can go as far as we want, even past the workpiece if that's what you want, without worrying about the leading pin falling off the end. Now, here's a scene from some earlier footage where I've actually done some routing uh, and you'll uh, notice that uh, the router did catch a little bit. So that was before I had perfected uh, the smooth glide of uh, setting the um, cleats a little bit higher than the workpiece. Now, what about the third problem, the problem of always being stuck with a centered uh, mortise? In some earlier footage that I uh, dropped, I explained very carefully how the two cleats had to be identical in thickness, otherwise you wouldn't get a centered mortise. And then as soon as I said that, I realized that, oh, you could pull the mortise over to one side or another just by using cleats that were different in the thicknesses. And that's why there's so many thicknesses in these guide cleats. So take a look at this for instance. One inch on one side, half an inch on the other. The mortise is going to shift over by one half of that difference. So one inch, a half inch, the difference is one half inch. The mortise is going to be off-centered by one quarter of an inch. Uh, here's an example of me making that calculation. Okay, I'm going to introduce the offset now. So here's my leg material, one and seven eighths of an inch across. It'll be easier to work things out if I convert that to 15 eighths of an inch. If I were to use the router bare naked, I would get a mortise that is, that is 15 sixteenths of an inch away from this face but I don't want centered mortises. I want the uh, aprons to be outbound. Uh, the reason is that my uh, mortises are fairly deep and I don't want them running into each other. So I'm going to shoot for a one quarter inch reveal. So one quarter is two eighths of an inch and the existing mortises are another three eighths of an inch back from that. So the existing mortise is going to be five-eighths of an inch away from this face. A centered mortise 
would be 15 sixteenths away from this face. So 15 sixteenths for a centered mortise minus 10 sixteenths for the desired position leaves me with 5 sixteenths of an inch. So the position of the mortise is going to be 5 sixteenths of an inch away from the center okay, in this direction by 5 sixteenths. So to get a 5 sixteenth inch offset I need a 5 eighths inch extra bit of material on that side. So when I build up to make to route out the mortise I'm going to use my one inch uh, thick um, uh, rails or yeah, rails um, so that the uh, router gets a smooth ride and then I'm going to add 5 eighths of an inch extra on the outbound side. Now when I prepared these things I prepared the smallest uh, dimension, the smallest thickness was a quarter inch so I had to rummage through the shop and I found some material that was an eighth of an inch thick and so I cut a panel uh, from that as well. So to get that <clears throat> mortise in the right place I have to add 5 eighths of an inch on this side. Now those of you who chose to be born in a country that uses metric, pat yourselves on the back. Well there it is, all done, the result of all those uh, mortises and uh, floating tenons. It's uh, a piano bench in uh, cherry. Uh, now if it ever happens that uh, you come to the end of your day and you've got some swear words uh, left over, try upholstering for the first time. Uh, you'll, you'll use them up. Okay then, what do you say we go after the fourth problem? What fourth problem? You didn't say there was a fourth problem. Well, yeah, there is. You see, <clears throat> once you start making mortises, say you're working with a table, uh, there's 16 mortises that you have to make. So, eight for the aprons, another eight for the legs. And you're going to get tired of constantly repositioning the stop blocks according to where the marks have been made on the wood. You're going to want to uh, adjust the stop blocks for the first of the mortises and then use the same stops over and over again for the remaining seven. So that's where these components come in. Let me bring you in for a closer look. So the fourth problem is that of um, constantly having to adjust stop blocks for every one of the mortises, even though seven mortises are just repetitions of the first. So I decided to make things a little bit fancier. And I won't go into details about this elaboration in this video, but if you're interested, leave me a comment and ask me for more information. Basically what they are, are some a cylinder and a few blocks. They're 3D printed and what they let me do is to set up the first workpiece and then to keep these things in place for the remaining seven. So you don't have to constantly be readjusting the stop blocks for every one of the mortise. So there's one stop block that sets the position of the workplace according to the cleats. And then these other stop blocks that have these tabs. The tabs fit a groove that's been cut into uh, this workpiece. And without going into the details of it, they let me position a stop block for the advance of the router and another stop block for the router's retreat. And they give me 1 16th of an inch resolution from an eighth of an inch through to 1 and 7 sixteenths of an inch. Okay, so I get a whole bunch of uh, different places where the router's travel can stop. And there's uh, two of each color because sometimes I might want to use the same measurement for the front and the back of the router. Let me just uh, illustrate that with a quick 
fake demo and uh, we can call this uh, video a wrap. So here's the setup just to illustrate the, uh, the workings of the uh, stops that I've added to the system. Um, <clears throat> so I've got the three quarter inch cleats on either side to give me the smooth glide that I want. The workpiece has been justified against the stop that you can't see in between these two guides. And then, taking my time, I adjusted the position and the orientation and of course the choice of whether it's the, uh, the red one or the blue one or the green one that I use to give me the right amount of travel according to whatever I've marked on the workpiece. So the first one takes a little bit of time to set up. But after that, you've got just the right amount of travel that you want for the workpiece. And the rest of the workpieces just have to go in, get justified against the inner stop. Uh, these guys stay in place. And then you can do the second and the third through to the seventh um, in a, without having to set the whole thing up again. Now, I haven't gone into detail about how I made these. I'd be happy to if there's any interest. So if you are interested in how these things were made, what their dimensions were, and all the rest of that, uh, leave me a comment. I'll make another video about it. But for now, let me just say, whatever your passion is, share it.